I was on this show, Scavland in Norway, and they did a little intro, and they said, um, Jordan Peterson attracts men to his, his talks. It's like, oh, that's scandalous. Oh, no. <laughs> He's talking to men. That's a terrible thing. Uh, moving on, the notion sort of that certain behaviors and trends which differ between men and women uh, is, are caused by the social construct is a, quite a prevalent view now. Is it possible to prove or disprove this using tools in psychology? Or well, it's true that many of the differences between men and women are socially constructed because many of the differences between people are socially constructed. Obviously, we're very malleable. We have an extraordinarily long dependency period, and we learn all sorts of things. And so the, the issue is never whether the behavioral differences between men and women, the psychological differences, are socially constructed. That isn't the claim of the social... That isn't, that, that isn't the claim that I'm attempting to, to dispute to the degree I'm disputing it. The claim of the radical social constructionists is that all of it's socially constructed. Well, that's wrong. It's simply wrong. And, and it's not only wrong, but it's wrong in a variety of extremely dangerous ways. So, for example, the social science with regards to the psychological differences, well, let's say, first of all, that we'd admit that certain morphological differences between men and women aren't socially constructed. If we can't agree on that, then we're not going to get anywhere. And then some, some more subtle biological differences on top of that. And then we might say, well, biological differences shade imperceptibly into psychological differences, since the psyche has a biological grounding. And so there's going to be psychological differences that are influenced by biology. And what are they? Well, we know what they are. There's temperamental differences between men and women, according to the best psychometric instruments we have for assessing personality, which are among the most reliable and valid measures in all of the social sciences. And those differences are not overwhelming, but they're, they're significant. And not only that, and this is the crucial, absolutely crucial issue, as your culture becomes richer and more egalitarian, those differences grow. And so what that means technically is that you cannot have equality of opportunity between men and women and equality of outcome. It's not possible. And as far as I'm concerned, the science on that is virtually settled. There was a paper published in Science last week they made a, an index of wealth and egalitarianism and correlated that with the magnitude of differences between male and female preference and calculated a correlation coefficient of 0.67, if I remember correctly, which is a larger correlation coefficient than is typical of 99.5% of all published social science studies. Right, large sample, and it was the third replication of the same phenomena in the last, phenomenon in the last month. And so even the London Times said, well, this is now one of the well, most well-documented facts in all of the social sciences. And maybe you're not happy with that fact. So you say, well, the social sciences are pseudosciences, and we'll just throw them out. It's like, fine, if that's the price you want to pay to cling desperately to your uh, thorough social constructionist ideology, then go right ahead. But the price you pay is, it isn't just the social sciences that you're going to throw out, it's also the biological sciences. And it seems to me that that's, uh, that's a heavy price to pay to hold on to an axiom that's of very little use anyways. So, so, of course things are socially constructed, obviously. But there's a big difference between partly and completely. And that's the difference between someone who's sensible and informed and someone who's ideologically rigid to the core. And for reasons that they don't even understand. I mean, the fundamental reason, the only reason you'd claim that all the differences between men and women are socially constructed would be if you were the sort of person who wished to remake human beings in the image of your ideological preferences. And that's what's driving the insistence. And if you're the sort of person who thinks that your redesign of human beings would make them better, then you're also the sort of person that other people should get away from very, very rapidly. <laughs> Drought flooding and ocean acidification unanticipated for 65 million years all result from climate change according to over 700 of your fellow scientists. So I was wondering whether you thought climate change could be an issue that could unite us all on left and right, moving us beyond debates about C16 to discussions at the UN at Katowice next month where perhaps humanity might finally discover its global map of meaning? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, the first reason is, is that um, I spent a lot of time reading. Uh, I worked for a UN committee for two years on sustainable economic and ecological development and read a very large amount during that period of time and learned a lot, much of which made me much more optimistic than I had been before I read the relevant literature, which was a real shock to me. But the climate change issue is an absolutely catastrophic, nightmarish mess, and the idea that that will unite us is that's that's <laughs> that's not going to unite us. I mean, um, first of all, it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics, and second, even if the claims, the more radical claims, are true, we have no idea what to do about it. And so, no. And besides, it's even worse than that. Here's the here's one of the worst things about the whole mess is so. As you project outwards with regards to your climate change projections, which are quite unreliable to begin with, and the unreliability of the measurement magnifies as you move forward in time, obviously, because the, the errors accumulate. And so if you go out 50 years, the error bars around the projections are already so, so wide that we won't be able to measure the positive or negative effects of anything we do right now. So how in the world are you going to solve a problem when you can't even measure the consequence of your actions? Like, how is that even possible? And, and besides that, well, wh what's the solution? What are we going to do? Switch to wind and solar? Well, good luck with that. Just try it and see what happens. We can't store the power. Germany tried it. They produced more carbon dioxide than they did when they started because they had to turn on their coal-fired plants again. That wasn't a very good plan. Well, we don't want nuclear. It's like, okay, what happens at night? Huh, the sun goes down. Well, isn't that something we shouldn't have taken, that we should have taken into account? Well, right, we've got to flip on the coal-fired plants. Well, so it was a complete catastrophe, and all that happened was the price of electricity shot up. It was like zero utility. So that's, that's not a solution. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we should cut back. We can't consume as much as we, sh as, we, as we are all consuming. It's like, well, maybe, except the data that I've read indicate that if you can get the GDP of people up to about $5,000 a year, then they start caring about the environment, and the environment cleans up, so you could make a perfectly... Strong case, I think, and a reasonable one, perhaps even a humane one, that the actual idea would be to get everybody in the world who's poor, desperately so, out of poverty as fast as possible, which would increase consumption in the short term, because then they'd start to care about the environment and things would clean up. It's like, okay, well, what are we going to do about global warming? Well, good luck figuring that out. I don't see a solution on the horizon. I look at Bjorn Lomberg's work. I really like Bjorn Lomberg. I think he's a real genius. You can look him up if you want. He took the um, UN Millennial Goals. There's 200 of them. That's way too many goals if you're serious about goals, by the way, because 200 goals isn't a plan. It's a wish list. You have to prioritize. I'm serious. You have to prioritize. But they won't prioritize because each of the goals has its constituents. And if you prioritize, then you irritate the constituents. But if you don't prioritize, then you can't implement the plan. So what Lomberg did was gather a team of teams of economists, multiple teams, some of whom were Nobel Prize winning economists. He had them assemble teams. He had them rank order uh, development goals in terms of their return on investment, all, all of the teams. Then he averaged across the teams and came up with a final list. And, and addressing global warming wasn't even on the list. The, the most fundamental, he wrote a book called How to Spend $75 Billion to Make the World a Better Place, and that's not very much money on a global scale. Almost everything that he recommended had to do with increased child nutrition in developing, in developing countries. It's like, these things are complicated, man. These are complicated. It's like, well, let's fix global warming. It's like, okay, well, good luck with that. First of all, how are you going to do that? And to think that will unite us, well, certainly not uniting us so far. So, no. And, and it's just... It's just it's the kind of low-resolution thinking that just gets us absolutely nowhere. I like what Lomberg did way better. I think it's way more intelligent. So, you know, maybe if you, if you increase child nutrition enough and, and you produce another, I don't know, 10 million geniuses as a consequence of that, and maybe one of them will figure out what to do about global warming. Well, I'm serious about that, you know? It's not a bad thing to increase the total sum of human brain power, you know? And so... It, it, we, we treat these things so lightly. Well, let's fix the planet. Well, we're going to concentrate on global warming. Well, why global warming? Well, because everyone thinks that's the biggest catastrophe. Well, maybe it is, but if you don't have a solution, well, and then what about all those other problems? What are you going to do about them? Well, we'll ignore them because we can feel good about, you know, being concerned about global warming. It's like, 
I don't, I don't, you know, one of the reasons, there's more trees in the Northern Hemisphere than there were 100 years ago. No one knows that, but it's true, and by a substantial margin. You know why, in part? Because people burned coal instead of wood. It's like everyone says, well, we shouldn't burn coal. It's like, okay, fair enough. What do you want to do, burn trees instead? Because that's what poor people would have done. It's like, coal isn't good. Well, it's better than burning wood. So these things are complicated. So they're, they're unbelievably complicated. And so, no, it's not going to unite us. And we're not going to do a damn thing about it either. So it doesn't really matter. So, well, what are we going to do? You're going to stop, like, having heat? You're going to stop having electricity? You're going to stop driving your cars? You're going to stop taking trains? It's like, you're not. You're going to stop using your iPhones? You're not going to do any of that. And no wonder. So, so, no. Um, one of the, uh, like... A lot of critics have said, uh, whether it's valid or not, that a lot of your, um, I guess, studies are sort of pseudo-science, and that a lot of it is just a way for you to, I guess, uh, a lot of it is informed by your Christian beliefs. Um, I was hoping if you could, like, I guess, talk about that a bit more, or whether it's not true or not, or whether it's... Well, the pseudo-science issue, that's pretty damn comical, especially given who it's usually, uh, what would you say, brought forth by. That would be, like, social constructionist gender studies theorist types. It's like, Jesus, being criticized by that group is like being nibbled to death by ducks from a scientific <laughs> perspective. You know, it's like, oh, you're criticizing... You're criticizing my science. It's like, well, you don't know anything about science. You don't know anything about biology. It's like, well, all of that's neo-colonialist element of the tyrannical patriarchy. It's like, okay, fine. Throw out the social sciences if that's what you want to do. But what I have, and it's not so much what I've done, although I have done research in gender differences in personality as part of my, as my what would you call it, t research output, we developed a questionnaire called the Big Five Aspect Scale, which is being widely used around the world, which provides what seems to be the highest resolution, psychometrically valid model of personality that's available today. There's contenders, but it's certainly up there in the top two or three. And we've mapped personality differences between men and women. Neutrally, it's like we didn't know what the differences were going to be or whether they showed up or not. But these studies that show that there are differences in, in temperament and interest between men and women... They are, look, you can say what you want about psychology. You can say, well, it's bunk. Psychometrics is, is bunk. Well, then you're going to sure get rid of sociology and, and political science and the econ economics and so forth because they are way more methodologically weak than psychology. But maybe you're willing to dispense with them too. But of psychological studies, the personality studies are the most psychometrically solid. They are the most reliable and valid and well-replicated. And they indicate that there are differences between men and women. They're not huge, although the differences in interest are quite big. But they're certainly large enough to produce quite a bit of difference at the extremes. And the extremes are where the action is in terms of things like occupational choice. So, and you can say, well, that's pseudoscience. And you can say, I'm a pseudoscientist. But what that means is that you have to say that about all the social sciences. And if you want to do that, and it's not like people cavil at doing that. I mean, we have critics who say that the entire scientific enterprise is nothing but a, 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 what a neo-colonial outgrowth of the Eurocentric, patriarchal, tyrannical worldview. And it's really been imposed as a way of, of, of continuing the oppression narrative or something like that. It's like, fine, if that you can do that. There's a price to be paid for it, and there's usually a performative contradiction involved, too, because all the people who purport not to believe in science are still perfectly happy to utilize all the crazy gadgets that the scientists have produced, and so they seem to believe in science well enough to do things like fly in airplanes and use their iPhones, and, you know, that, that's actually an indicate, indication of their belief in the theories upon which the technologies are predicated, but that sort of inter internal coherence is too much for the typical postmodernist. And so, and with regards to uh, my pseudoscience status as a psychologist, I'm a perfectly, uh, what would you say, I'm a perfectly credible research psychologist. I'm well cited, my, my papers are published in good journals, and I've spent 30 years trying to figure out what the most reliable measurements are in psychology. As I got obsessed with that in the 1990s when I found out that so much of what psychologists 
we're measuring wasn't real, which the psychologists all figured out, by the way, about four years ago. Um, and so I went for the core. It's like, what's reliable? What can we measure? Ah, we can measure IQ. That doesn't mean that we're happy about it, that's for sure, but we can measure it. What else can we measure? Looks like we can measure personality with something approximating a five-dimensional structure. I wasn't happy about that. I thought it was a theory that was as dull as dishwater. Ditch water? Dishwasher? Whatever. Either of those. <laughs> They're all equally dull. Um, it, was a, it was a theory without romance, as far as I was concerned. I'm quite interested in psychoanalytic theories, for example. But the brute power of the statistical processes that produced the models is it's undeniable. And it has high predictive validity. I mean, the best predictor of your life outcome, the best psychometric predictor is IQ. The second best is conscientiousness. And they're powerful predictors. They still leave about between 50 to 75% of your life outcome, economically speaking, to random factors that can't be measured, which is a lot, you know, but as far as what we can measure goes, they're very powerful predictors. And so they, they can wave the pseudoscience flag all they want. It's not going to help. Unless, as I said, you want to throw out the entire edifice. It's like... Go ahead. You don't think the social sciences are worth anything? It's like, dispense with them. We're trying to do that anyways. And the radical types are doing the same thing to the STEM fields. They're after them like you cannot believe, especially in the United States. So, we don't like the results. Therefore, the entire enterprise is suspect. It's okay. It's not wise. You know, and what the hell is the problem? What, there's no differences between men and women? We're actually going to believe that? So, here, here's, a, here's a better theory. And this is what's supported by the facts. There are differences in interest and preference between men and women. You eradicate the sociocultural differences by e making your society more egalitarian. The biological differences maximize. Okay, what's the problem? Men and women get to choose what they want to do. They don't choose the same things. Is that a problem? What are you going to do? Force them? Because that is what you're going to do. Well, when are you going to start? When they're in, like, kindergarten? And how are you going to do that? Especially if the differences are large. You're going to do that in a relatively tyrannical way. Yeah, it's about time the damn lobsters showed up. <laughs> they didn't do that at Oxford. <laughs> so, like, I'm serious about this. It's like, let's say you're a feminist. Okay, let's like, well, okay, what, what is it that you want as a feminist? Do you want all women to be the same and all of them to be exactly the same as all men? Or do you want to let the cards fall where they're going to and let people make free choice? It's like, it isn't obvious to me which of those is more commensurate with the ideologically pure and virtuous version of feminism. As far as I'm concerned, there's differences between men and women, in interest, especially in interest, because women tilt towards interest in people, and men tilt towards interest in things. And that drives occupational differentiation. And it maximizes in the Scandinavian countries. It's like, well, what are you going to do about that? It's not true. It's like, yeah, sorry. It's true. Well, we don't know what to do about that. Oh, the whole science is suspect. It's like, maybe your damn theory is suspect. I mean, that's a possibility. It might be worth thinking about it before you throw everything else out. What are you going to replace that with? Judith Butler's sociocultural theory? Well, good luck, good luck founding your existence on that. So, pseudoscience, Jesus. 